Five weeks from today, voters in Iowa will head to caucus sites and cast the first votes in the 2024 presidential election cycle. So over the weekend, just days after the final GOP debate of the year, we got a chance to sit down with Republican presidential candidate and former U.S. ambassador to the U.N., Nikki Haley, along with her daughter, Rena, for a wine-ranging interview on everything from the Israel-Hamas war, the debate over abortion rights and transgender athletes in sports, and of course, her views on former President Donald Trump. That conversation is tonight's prime focus. Ambassador, certainly a big surge in the polls lately. You've been saying on the campaign trail, uh, I just have one more fellow I got to catch up with. Let's chat about that fellow just for a moment. I want to start where the last debate left off. One question went unanswered as far as is Donald Trump fit to be president? Chris Christie said he's unfit. I want to just put that directly to you in a yes or no. Do you think Donald Trump today in 2023 is fit to be president? It, it's not about fitness. I think he's fit to be president. It's should he be president. I don't think he should be president. You know, I thought he was the right president at the right time. I agreed with a lot of his policies. The problem is you see our country is in disarray. Our world is on fire. And you can't defeat Democrat chaos with a Republican chaos. And Donald Trump brings us chaos. I think I offer a different approach. No drama, no vendettas, no whining. We have to get this right. We've got to start focusing on getting our economy back on track, getting our kids reading and back where they should be in education, making sure we stop the crime on the streets, closing our borders once and for all, and letting our enemies around the world know that America is back. That's hugely important. And this is a time where we need a new generational leader. We've got to look at the, the issues that we're dealing with coming forward with new solutions, not focusing on negativity and baggage of the past. So it's not about being fit. It's just I don't think he's the right person to be president. As you well know, uh, the U.S. recently vetoed a U.N. Security Council vote calling for a ceasefire. Groups like Doctors Without Borders have said that that was a vote against humanity. I know that you have said no pause, no ceasefire. To date, we're talking about 17,000 Palestinians who have died, 7,000 of them children. My question to you is, how does this end at, at what cost? Look, we care about the people in Gaza, especially the civilians. We know Hamas is there. We want to make sure that we get as many people out safe. We've got our hostages there. But the reality is, the best way to help the people in Gaza is to eliminate Hamas. That's who's been controlling their situation for so long. That's who uses them as human shields. And so what we know is, any time they've given a ceasefire to Hamas, people die. They kill Israeli soldiers, they kidnap Israeli soldiers, we see what happens. America and Israel value human life. It's what makes us a civilized country. Hamas does not value human life. We saw that with the beheadings. We saw that with the babies burned alive. We saw that with the girls that were raped at the concert and their naked bodies dragged through the streets of Gaza. And what did Hamas say? Death to Israel, death to America. This is evil at its worst. And in order to get rid of evil, you have to eliminate it. The only way to do that is to eliminate evil. So we should support Israel, give them whatever they need, whenever they need it. We should eliminate Hamas once and for all, because if we weaken them, they'll come back. And we should do whatever it takes to, to bring our hostages home. This is personal for America. 33 Americans were butchered. We have American hostages. We've got to make sure that we do right by the people who've suffered. Where should the Palestinians go? Well, you know, they should be going through the Rafah Gate and Egypt take them. But I've always said that, you know, what you should have is they should go to pro-Hamas countries. Qatar, Iran, you know, if you send them there, Turkey, those are pro-Hamas countries. That's where they should go. But they're on the run for their lives, taking whatever they can, their kids in tow. They're not able to get into Egypt. How are you supposed to even make it to Qatar at this point? In that telling that Egypt won't take them, why won't Egypt take them? Because they don't trust which ones are terrorists and which ones aren't. It's a sad state of affairs. But it, the reality of that evil is very clear in Arab countries, too. Arab countries have very much always been cautious and know the threats that Iran can place. They don't want those terrorist proxies coming after them. Saudi Arabia felt the Houthis in that fight for Yemen. Egypt knows exactly what they can do. But instead of the world hitting on Israel, who was brought to her knees in the worst in invasion since the Holocaust, 
why isn't everybody talking to Egypt? Why aren't they talking to Turkey? Why aren't they talking to Qatar? Why aren't they talking to Iran? Why aren't they doing something to help the Palestinians? If that's the case, why is it you come back to Israel and the U.S.? It's always the case. Everybody loves to help Israel when she's hit. But all of a sudden, they hit, they, they're quick to, to beat up on Israel when she hits back. If that had happened to America, do you not think we would have hit back? But where are the friends of those pro-Hamas people? Where are the friends of Gaza? They should be the ones doing what they need to to save them. It shouldn't be on Israel who watched their people get butchered on October 7th. You've talked before about your own fertility issues when having your own two children. Uh, when we look at the numbers, polls in particular, even here in Iowa, this deeply red state, 70% uh, of women say they want at least some access to abortion. I'm curious, as the only woman running on the GOP side, do you think that your gender gives you a different perspective when it comes to this matter? I do. I do think it gives me a different perspective because I think for women, while it's personal for men too, for women, we feel it. We feel this for our daughters, we feel it for our sisters and our friends. I had a college roommate who was raped and I wouldn't wish on anyone what she went through wondering if she was pregnant. And so everybody has a story. I know what these women's stories are and I'm very sympathetic to it. And I think what we've seen from the Democrat side is they put fear in this issue and scared women. What we've seen from the Republican side is they've used judgment. There is no place for fear or judgment when you're talking about how do we save as many babies as we can and support as many moms as we can. We need to start dealing with this res with respect and with compassion. That's the only way that we'll move forward. You've said that the women's issue of our time is not actually abortion, but trans kids in sports. A and I'm curious what you say to that young trans kid who, who wants to play sports that I think that they can find a place for trans kids to play sports, but biological boys should not be playing in girls' sports. My daughter ran track in high school. I don't even know how I would have that conversation with her. How do we tell our girls that it's okay to have a biological boy in their locker room? It's not, in no scenario. So we have to remember that strong girls become strong women. Strong women become strong leaders. That doesn't happen by putting biological boys in women's sports. You've got women who have worked so hard all their life to really get to points in high school and college that they want to. And to have a biological man who's physiologically different athletically go and take that away from those women. No, we're not going to erase a woman like that. You can't do that. You can find other ways of dealing with this, but it doesn't have to be on the backs of our girls who we're trying to make strong. It's the wrong thing to do, and I'll always fight against that. All right. Can we bring Rena in? Hi, Rena. Hi. How are you? Good, Very how nice are you? to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. She, you she, you're her mini-me. Yes. With blue eyes. With blue eyes, right? <laughs> What would you say to, to Gen Z voters as far as why your mom should be the next president of the United States? Um, she's strong, she's genuine, she's honest. What you see is what she gets. She, um, she's the same person at home as she is with the people, and so I think that's the special thing. How did you feel when Vivek Ramaswamy brought you into the debate talking about that you were a TikTok user? Um, I mean, I felt like it was unnecessary. I feel like it's a kind of a people know not to bring kids into a situation and so I felt like it was kind of uncalled for but and you know <laughs> she's the least political member of our family and so since whenever I've run before Michael's always been that person in debates that gives me good energy that I look to that gives me the smile and she's taken it upon herself um, to be at every single mm. debate to sit in the seat he would normally sit in so she looks at me and she gives me positive mm -hmm. energy and she smiles smile and so you know when when <laughs> When they say something about her, and I know she's sitting in that front row, as a mom, you know, I get my back up. But she's been a real, a real support and, a, and good energy, and I love that. Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.